belongs to you You are the one and only God You are the one and only God What miracles, what wonders, what greatness belongs to you What miracles, what wonders, what greatness belongs to you From deepest, dark, and certain death, you bought our souls' deliverance. We thank you. We thank you. From deepest, dark, and certain death, you bought our souls' deliverance. We thank you. We thank you From deepest, darkest, certain death You bought our soul's deliverance We thank you We thank you From deepest, darkest, certain death You bought our soul's deliverance want to thank you this morning we just want to thank you this morning Lord for all that you've done all that you are God you are the one and only God you are the one and only God what miracles what wonders what greatness belongs to you You are the one and only God You are the one and only God What miracles, what wonders, what greatness belongs to you What miracles, what wonders, what greatness belongs to you What miracles, what wonders, what greatness belongs to you Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. And taste of his goodness Find what you're looking for For God so loved The world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Where are we at? Jesus is waiting there. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. So 
guitar issues, but God is still good. He still loves us regardless of what happens this morning. We know that he is here. Well, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures the faith I never know. Then you came along, yes, and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. Oh, hearing you love, singing out if you know it. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, yeah. and there's not a place. Your mercy and grace It won't find me again, again, again Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you Nothing this world could offer, Lord Is better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. 
This is why you're so much better. And you turn morning to dancing. And you give beauty for ashes. And you turn shame into glory. And you're the only one who cares. You turn mourning to dancing. Hey. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn grave. You turn graves into garbage. Hey. You turn bones into armies. I've seen them do it. Turn seas in the highways. You're the only one who cares. He's the only God. He's the only one who cares. Oh, there's nothing. Sing it if you believe it. Some noise for the Lord this morning. Turn bones into armies. 
You turn seas in highways. You're the only one who can. Only one. You're the only. You're the only one. Only one who can. God, we declare that you are the only God. The one and only God. Worthy of all of our praise, worthy of all of our thoughts, worthy of all of our worship. Even in a baby's cry, God. (laughs) Worshiping the Lord this morning. God, we love you. Thank you that there is not an end to your goodness and your grace. Where can we run? Where can we hide? That you will not find us. Deepest of depths, highest of heights, your love it chases us. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, we can't escape your love mm. and we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness we will never see the end we will never see the end of your through the fire or we pass through the flood you will be with us though we walk through the valley the darkest of night your love will be our light when we are in plenty or we are in want you will always be enough mm. and we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness
promises that you have made we can say God we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness God we will never see the end we will never see your goodness we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness God we will never see the end we will never see the end of your goodness too good. Lord, we believe that you are amazing, that you love us so well. Thank you for continuing to love us through it all. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys can take a seat. I'm Jenny, and I've been at Crosswind for a little over a year now. Well, the first time my daughter came here, she came here, she was invited to BBS. And the first night of BBS, she came home, and, and she wanted to know, hey, can we go back, you know? And I was like, well, you're going back tomorrow night. And she was like, no, can we go back, like, Sunday? Basically, we've been here since. Um, it's been a great community for her. And then as soon as I got involved with the home groups, um, I found a new family and got a little more involved with the children's ministry and everything. I do love like all the opportunities that have been opened up because of my home group. I mean, these are people that aside from Jay and Bethany, I had never met before I started coming here. And I've um, been with them, I've helped plan baby showers and we've, you know, gone out outside of home group, outside of church and just hung out. It's good to find those people that you didn't know you need, but God knew you needed. Like I had no idea I needed these people in my life, but I need them more than I want them. So, and I know that sounds bad, but I need them more than I knew um, for sure. Um, and they've definitely been a bright spot in my life. People to support me, do life with me, pray for me. Um, asked or not, you know, just know that they're praying for me, whether it's good or bad going on, going on in my life, because that's what I'm doing, you know, for them. Um, and I have definitely found that here, found that 
big time in my home group. Like I just know I'm prayed for, <laughs> I'm covered. And there we are. Hey, we are. Good morning. Um, my name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor here at Crosswind. I'm so thankful that you're joining us uh, for uh, the worship service this morning, whether you're watching online or here in the auditorium. It'll be neat over the course of the rest of the series, Find Your People, as we will hear from individuals um, who have been impacted by groups uh, and by, uh, by pursuing uh, authentic Christian community here uh, at the church. I'm super pumped uh, to get to share some of those stories uh, with you all. Uh, when I was in seminary, uh, I, I was taught something both explicitly and implicitly, meaning it was, it was something that, that was actually said in class, um, but it was something that was implied even on a, on a deeper level. And that was, um, there was this barrier that had to be erected between the pastor and the congregation. Um, that that uh, that 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 I, you know the pastor could never really share what was going on or or be vulnerable with the congregation uh, because if you did that uh, the, the congregation wouldn't be able to follow you they wouldn't uh, respect you they 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 wouldn't um, uh, uh, you know listen to anything it was that you had to say if they knew uh, you know all of the things that you kind of struggled with and and I can remember sitting in the classroom thinking what a terrible Terrible thing to teach, uh, you, you know, individuals, pastors in particular, because if if the church needs each other um, and was designed for community, the pastor, as a member of the church, needs that same type of of, of camaraderie, that that same type of community, and um, and so uh, what I did uh, very early on. Uh, is I, I said, I want to remove any physical barrier between me and the congregation. And so it was kind of a symbolic move. At my, my last church, we actually had this big, massive wooden pulpit that I would stand behind. It was like this lectern type thing. And, uh, and I just got rid of it. I was like, no, I, I don't want there to be any barrier between me and the congregation. And when it came to being vulnerable on this stage, like, I, I feel like I do a pretty good job of that. I, I've told you all, for instance, uh, when I, I'm a lousy husband, and I've told you when I fight with my wife, because I do sometimes. Um, and, uh, and I've told you when I'm a lousy parent. Because there's times where I make mistakes as a parent. There's times when I lose my temper um, with telemarketers. Um, and, and I've told you all of those stories along the way. And what I found is that it's easy for me to be vulnerable when I'm up on this stage. Because really, I can't see your eyes and I can't see you looking at me. And, and you don't get an opportunity to talk back to me because I'm the one with the microphone. And, and, and so uh, I, I don't have an issue being vulnerable here on the stage, but but one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it, it becomes a little bit different of a story. And when it came to, to even my own groups that I've been a part of, I, I've recognized that there's a tension there when I have to look someone in the eyes and say, here's where I'm struggling. And, 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 and in particular, when they ask to pray for me or they ask if there's something they can do for me, I can remember very clearly I was sitting in a home group in my living room and, 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 and I had a really rough week and, and, and there were some things that were kind of going on in the church world. And I can remember saying to the group, hey, I'm really struggling. And they, they, they looked at me and, and they did what we teach them to do in group. They said, can we pray for you? And in that moment, I just was like, no. No, like I, I, you know, and they made me, you know, anyway. But regardless of that, like, it, it's so difficult, I think, sometimes to be vulnerable one on one. And, and, and then you go come to church and, and we say, like, one of the key tenets of Crosswind Church is to, to go and engage in authentic Christian community. And one of the 
hallmarks of authentic Christian community is being vulnerable and opening yourself up. And it can be incredibly difficult and incredibly intimidating, especially if you're a man, by the way, right? Like, like you're a guy and you show up at church and we go, well, you want you to sit in a circle and share your feelings, right? And, and every man is just like, oh, no, like I'm not going to do that, right? It, it's something that can be incredibly, incredibly difficult, especially if you're a guy. I, I grew up, for instance, uh, being taught by my family that, that really you, 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 know, you play things kind of close to the vest. Like you don't, you don't you know, air your dirty laundry out in front of everyone. And, and in fact, I can remember being a kid asking my dad one time uh, who he voted for for president, and his response to his only son was, that's none of your business. Right? I, 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 that was just the way that I was kind of taught, uh, kind, of, kind of growing up, that you kind of keep things uh, in and you kind of hide things because if you let other people know where you're struggling, then they won't respect you, they won't follow you, they'll use it to hurt you, right? They'll shame you, they'll guilt you. And so as a result, we learn. Be, be it on purpose or, or unintentionally, we learn to hide as people. And hide from being known. And you want to know the, the, the dirty secret? Like, this is the problem that, that a lot of people have with church, is that if there's any place you should be able to go where you can be vulnerable and be real, and here's my struggle, it's, it's within the body of Christ, and yet for so many of us, our experience with church has been completely different than that, right? Like we, we hide and we put on our mask and we show up at church and we tell everybody we're doing fine, when in reality our world is imploding all around us. And then when we see somebody that declares bankruptcy, or we see the house go into foreclosure in the paper, or when the marriage implodes, we just kind of go, I never would have guessed it. I never knew because it looked like they had everything together because they put on the mask and they put on the show. Maybe that's your problem that you've had with church, is you feel like you have to come and pretend to be something that you're not. Now, what I want to talk about today is the fact that it didn't always have to be that way. Like it wasn't that way, that you were created, not just for community, but you were created to be known and to know others fully. And today, to, to figure out where it went wrong, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to an event that occurred that changed everything and forced all of us to want to hide behind the masks that we wear so well every day. So we're going to be in Genesis today, and we're going to start in, in chapter 2, and we're going to head over to chapter 3 uh, along the way, so you can follow along uh, on your phone or your device or on the screen, or if you actually have like a paper Bible that's a book, you can do that too. Um, and, and we're going to be in Genesis uh, chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 18. The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place in his flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So, so God says, I'm going to create, by the way, if you remember uh, the Genesis account of creation, uh, God creates us out of a position of community in himself. Let us make man in our own image. Garrett talked about that last week, this idea that God exists in perfect community with himself and, and wants to create us 
to be in community. You were designed to live in community with one another. It, it's like it's the only time in all of creation where God says something is not good. Uh, up to that point, everything has been good. It has been good. It has been very good. But when he sees that man is all alone, he goes, it is not good. And so he makes a helper suitable for man. He, he brings Eve to the man and presents her to him. And now all of a sudden there is this connectivity that, that man has with someone else. A connectivity that you were supposed to. To have. And what I love about verse 25 is it says that they were both naked and unashamed. And, and, and that is not, you know, an overtly sexual kind of reference there. The idea behind that is that they were completely exposed, completely vulnerable. They knew each other completely and they had no reason to hide from one another. When God created you, he created you without Shame. And you, you want to know something that I found pretty interesting as I thought about that this week. I thought about how children uh, have to be taught shame surrounding the, their, their flaws. That they have to be taught, hey, there are things that you don't say in public, things that you don't do in public. I can remember uh, my youngest daughter, Abigail, um, when she got uh, to go to children's worship for the very first time at my last church. She was so excited to get to go to kids' worship. She was finally old enough. Uh, she was three at the time. And, uh, and she went into children's worship, and I went to go pick her up afterwards, and, and, and the, the teacher of kids' worship was, was kind of chuckling. And I said, what, what happened? She's like, well, Abby was really excited to be here. And, um, and I asked, you know, is there anything we can pray for? And Abby raised her hand, and, and I called on her, and I said, Abby, what can we pray for? And she said, sometimes when we're at home, my daddy poots. And I thought, I need you to not share that information, right? <laughs> right? But, but our kids are so vulnerable and so open, and they get it. They have to be taught shame. Adam and Eve were, were in a perfect environment, and they knew each other completely, and they had no shame surrounding it. And then something happened, and then something changed. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So Satan shows up, and he goes and he talks to Eve. I, I've always kind of wanted to know, uh, did Eve think something was up, right? Or the other animals talking? Or, or was it just this one snake that was talking? Like, did she, did she, you know, think maybe something was a little crazy that this animal was talking to her? And so this snake talks to her, and what Satan does is so subtle. He takes the focus away from God's provision, all of the trees that God had given them to eat, right? He takes away the focus from the provision, and he puts it on the prohibition. So he takes, he takes the focus away from all that God has given to provide, and he, and he puts it on the thing that she doesn't have. He puts it on the thing that, 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 that he, God has prohibited Eve to, to have. And in doing so, all of a sudden, he, he, he kind of twists God's statement just a little bit. Does he say you can't eat from any of the trees? Well, no, that's not what he says. Look, look what Eve says in verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. I, I think at this point Eve probably hadn't thought much about the tree in the middle of the garden because she had everything she could ever want. She had everything that she could, could possibly need. All of the food, all of the fruit, all of the trees. She had a perfect relationship with God. She probably had never thought about what she didn't have until Satan brought it up. 
And the thing is, folks, is that we do the exact same thing, right? Think about your worst mistakes, the biggest regrets that you have. It all began because you were focused in on something that you didn't have or something that you thought was better than what it was that you did have. It was a different relationship. It was the new car. It was the bigger house. It, it was all of those things that the world tells us we should chase after. And we went and we chased after those things because uh, we forgot to focus in on just exactly what God had provided for us. But that's what the world does. That's what Satan does. It's so subtle. He takes your focus away from the provision and he focuses it on the prohibition and the thing that you don't have. And now, now that he's kind of got her baited, now that he's got her focus changed, look what happens next. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's the lie that Satan gets you to buy into and me to buy into. And it's that God is holding out on you. There's something that he has that he's, he's holding in. And he's not giving you. And when you buy into that lie, you will be tempted to chase after the thing that you think you don't have. The thing that you think will make you complete. The thing that you think will make you whole. Eve, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. She, she justified it. She looked at the fruit and said, oh, it, it looks good. It's, it's 100% organic, right? She, 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 she justified it. She, she said, it, it's pleasing for the eye. It's desirable. I, I, I don't see any reason why I shouldn't eat it. And she takes it and she eats it. Men, I think a lot of times we, we try to blame Eve for sin entering into the world. I want you to take note that she gives some to her husband who was with her. He was standing there the whole time. He was the one that had heard God's provision and prohibition, and yet he sat silent. Men, we've been largely silent ever since. Listen, it, it, she gives some, and she, she eats the fruit, and Adam eats the fruit, and it says at once their eyes were opened, and now they realized something they didn't realize before. Now they realized that they were naked. Now they realized that they had shame. And now they had to hide themselves. They, they, they sewed together fig leaves to cover up their nakedness. I think this is kind of interesting. Who are they, cover, like, who are they hiding from? They're hiding from each other. They had, they had been previously been fully exposed to one another. Now all of a sudden something had changed. Now all of a sudden there's shame that entered in because sin penetrated their hearts. And now they felt the desire to hide. And men and women have been hiding ever since. But, but here's the good news. Here's the good news. It doesn't end there. The story doesn't end with them hiding from each other. The story goes to, to, to a whole nother level. Look at verse 8. Then, man said to his, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God said to the man, where are you? This is so cool. Watch. The way that the Hebrew language is worded here, right? The, the language that the, that the Old Testament was written in. 
is, is it implies that when God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, that it was a regularly occurring thing. It was like he had a standing appointment with Adam and Eve every day where he showed up in the garden. Now, let me tell you what's so cool about that. God knew that they had sinned. God knew that they had fallen. He was omnipotent. He knew everything that had happened, and yet he continued to show up. It was messy, and he didn't walk away from the mess. He walked towards the mess. And when you find yourself in the mess of life, when you find yourself in the destruction that comes from the disobedience that you uh, bring upon yourself, I need you to understand that God walks into your mess. And he shows up and he seeks you out. He doesn't abandon you. Simply because you've made a mistake. He shows up and he says, where are you? Look, look what man says in verse 10. It says, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? I find this is kind of funny. A good counselor that, that you would go to, right, is not going to, uh, to tell you what it is you've done. He's going to bait you into it. God kind of like, hey, I know what you've done. Why don't you tell me what you've done? Have you eaten from this tree? Who told you that you were naked? Well, Adam tries to pass the blame on to Eve, and Eve tries to pass the blame on to the serpent, and God curses the serpent. He takes the serpent's legs away. This is, this is why snakes are accursed, and why anybody that ever has a pet snake needs to have serious mental uh, health like evaluation, right? It's Satan's hand puppet, right? God took their legs away, okay, and he punishes man, and he punishes woman, and the story should end there, but it doesn't. In verse 21 of chapter 3, it says, and the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. He did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. He provided a grace and a restoration, and he fixed what it was that sin had broken. Listen, you were created to be fully known without shame. You were created to be fully known without shame. But when sin entered into the world, in the story that we just read, it wrecked everything and it brought shame into, into the world. And it penetrated your hearts and it has caused you to want to hide from yourself and hide from other people. And when we come together as a body of Christ, we're asked to be vulnerable and we're asked to be real with one another. And I want you to understand that is not an easy task. It is something that is incredibly, incredibly difficult because it is not natural because of sin and if we're honest with ourselves, we're afraid, maybe it's fear or pride or whatever it may be, that if someone knows us fully, that they'll reject us or they'll use it against us to hurt us or to harm us or that they'll lose respect for us or, or any other number of, of, of struggles that we have in being vulnerable. And yes, I want you to understand that when you enter in community and when you are vulnerable with someone else, you run the risk of being hurt. Yes, you do. But I'm telling you, there is no other better way to live than to be known and fully known. And it, Paul would write thousands of years later 
after this event. Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God does not condemn you. Why should you be concerned about another human being condemning you? And yet, and yet we do. And yet we hide. And so what I want to encourage you to do, because I know that this task is so difficult, I want to encourage you to take a small step. I want to encourage you to, 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 to take a move in the direction or a step in the direction of vulnerability. And, and I want you to do a couple of different things. I want you to just do an experiment for the next uh, seven days, okay? I want you, number one, to stop asking the question, how are you, when you don't want an answer, okay? I, I want you, if you ask how are you, I want you to maybe even follow that up with the dot, 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 really, right? Because we don't want an answer. It's just kind of like a, a, a polite way of kind of, of kind of interacting with one another. We ask people all the time, how are you? And we come up with cool phrases like, I'm fair to middling, right? Or if I was any, any better, I'd be twins. Or I'm finer than a hog's, fair, you know, what is it, a, a, a frog's hair or whatever. Like, we come up with all of those different kind of things that we say, right? That, that, you know, I'm still standing or I'm, 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 I'm upright, you know, or I'm better than the alternative. We come up with all of these sayings. What if we just stopped for, for, for just asking people, uh, you know, hey, how are you if we don't really mean that we want an answer? Maybe it means you just say, hey, good to see you, right? Or, or, or you come up with something else. The, the other thing that I want to encourage you to do is that when someone asks you, how are you, to share one thing about you for real that, that, that is, is, is going on in your life. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, completely opening up. Just try to step into that vulnerability and just share one thing. You asked how I was, let me tell you, right? This is going great. This is not going so well. What would it look like if, if just for a week, if we just, we just stopped pretending and stopped hiding and took a small step into vulnerability with one another? I'm telling you, it is risky, but there is no better way to live. The last thing that I want to encourage you to do, last week Garrett kicked off the series and he told you that he wasn't going to ask you to sign up for groups. I am. <laughs> I wonder if you'd be willing to step into a small group, a, just, just an, a, a safe environment where you can share what's going on in your life, pray for one another, experience what Jenny talked about in, in the video before we started today, real, true, authentic Christian community. And to do that, we want to make it as easy as we possibly can. On the screen right now, there's a QR code. You may want to take your phone out, scan that, right? Get that, that, it works, I promise. It's like witchcraft. I don't know how it works, but it does. It'll take you to a website where you fill out a, a form, and, and there you can, can choose, I want to be a part of a group. I'm interested in maybe leading a group. I, I'm interested in hosting a group in my home. Uh, you, you can say, hey, th this group, is, you know, the, the particular group that I associate with, it's not represented in group life at Crosswind. I, I would love to see a men's group or a women's group. I would love to see a college group, whatever it may be, and you have a place where you can put that there on the form. If scanning the, the screen is just a little bit outside of your comfort zone, we've got this QR code in tables in the foyer at the Welcome Center and in the starting point room as well. We want you, right, to, to, to know that you can sign up, and this is going to be available throughout the rest of the series. Sign up and have someone talk to you about what it looks like to be a part of a group on some level. If you don't like QR codes and you don't like the Internet, come to the starting point room. We'll help you figure it out, okay? Because we want everyone to know that even though vulnerability is risky, there is no better way 
to live. You were created to be known and known fully and without shame. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to come here today. Thank you for, um, for creating us um, out of community and for community. Thank you for, um, for creating us to be known and fully known and, and to be known without shame. And God, I'm so thankful that, that you don't condemn us. Why then am I so afraid of being known by someone else? God, I pray that, that, that we would all take a step into vulnerability. We all take a step into being known and being fully known. And God, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to recognize those opportunities that we have and the courage to step into them no matter what the cost may be, no matter how difficult it may be. Because although it's risky, there is no better way to live. God, we love you. We trust you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming. See you next week.